My name is Joshua Gibson, and you are listening to the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, a show dedicated to promoting a message of critical thinking as it pertains to strength training, nutrition, and well-being. This is done through interviews with experts, high-level athletes, coaches, and people heavily involved in strength sports and athletic development. Pull up a chair, grab a coffee, and let's get on to today's podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. I'm your host. Today I am joined by a, another co-host. Generally or typically it's Max Ada. Today it is Tom Newton. Tom, how are you? Doing pretty well, Josh. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and, and just quickly before we introduce today's guest, Tom, maybe you can give uh, a, kind of an explanation for... Uh, why you're here, uh, what your background is, and, and how this is all connected to the podcast. Well, uh, first off, Josh, thank you for, for having me on. Um, I feel entirely insufficient to be a participant <laughs> here. Um, but uh, my background is really in, in business. I have an MBA from Ohio State University. Um, the last three years, I've been in an operations role from a managerial standpoint with a startup here in Columbus, Ohio called EFUSE. Um, it's a company uh, that really works in esports and gaming and tournament management. But my interest is really in um, or has kind of veered towards uh, psychology, positive psychology and act and self-determination theory. Um, those two in particular have piqued my interest over the last uh, few months, uh, act most recently. And uh, yeah, just excited to have a great conversation today. Yeah. And, and I think, the reason Tom kind of emphasized that is because we are joined today by Stephen Hayes. Um, Stephen, I could I could do a very very uh, poor job of introducing you, or I could have you introduce yourself, and and we can kind of run through uh, your background, uh, what you've done, where you've been, and I think it'd give the the listeners a fuller idea of of kind of who you are and what you've done. Yeah, happy to do that, and uh, thanks for having me on, Josh, and. Uh... Uh, Tom. Yeah, well, I'm a, a psychologist who's spent the, the last 40 years trying to essentially um, yeah, hack the human mind, get down to the smallest set of principles that do the most good in the most areas. And we think that we've done that. I think actually, as an empirical fact, we have done that. I think we know, uh, not that it's a final answer or anything, but it's the smallest set that does the most things with the most studies behind it. You know, these principles, which you call psychological flexibility, the extension of those processes, I'm best known for what's called acceptance and commitment therapy or in a performance context or business acceptance and commitment training act in either case. And, uh, but Psychological flexibility is spreading into lots of different uh, intervention approaches, uh, including in sports, but in organizations, mental health areas, social wellness, physical health, and so on. So uh, I'm here as a a geek scientist who is uh, interested and has spent a lot of time in trying to be useful to the world and, uh, you know, go from principles to methods to performance uh, so that uh, there's tools you can use uh, to whatever accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish in life. And I know that generally it's hard to pull out one defining moment or critical moment in which it's like, this is my life's calling, or this is the thing I'm going to pursue and, and, and push, push all of myself into. Um, but, you know, looking back on, on your life and, and looking back on, you know, your education and maybe even before that, when did you kind of get that pull towards psychology or towards um, human behavior that, that kind of dragged you down this path of, of developing or being part of the development of, of ACT and then the proliferation of the research supporting it? Yeah, I actually can identify those pivot points uh, pretty clearly and you can uh, uh, walk through it. If you just search TEDx talks and put my name in there, you'll find two. Uh, look at the one uh, called something like Turning Love and uh, Pain into Purpose, um, uh, my first one. And I walk through just my personal history and it. 
you know, the answer to your question uh, w would eventually go back to uh, hiding under my bed at eight years old while hearing my parents fight, with my dad coming home drunk and my mom screaming at him. And why that was a pivot point, um, maybe we'll get into it, but you can, uh, uh, the TEDx talk walks through it. But the pivot point that really sort of uh, shows up as uh, the work on ACT and psychological flexibility is as a young academic uh, getting caught up in a panic disorder and spinning down in three years uh, into this place where even going to sleep at night was something that was really hard because I was going to wake up in the middle of the night in a panic attack. And um, that talk tell, walks through the kind of hitting bottom and finding in the bottom that actually there wasn't a way out, but there was a way in. And it was 180 degrees from where my mind told me I needed to go. And, you know, I've spent the rest of my life. I mean, that is happening, I think, in 1980, best I can figure it out. It's kind of hard to go back and but by 1981, I'm doing workshops on what now is called ACT. So it's 40 years old uh, as of last uh, October. And, um, and it's been a one step at a time process, invisible for the first 10 years, really, because it was really focused on getting the, the philosophy nailed and the basic principles laid down and a strategy. And then, uh, a popular book called Get Out of Your Mind and Your Life was written up in Time Magazine in a five-page story, and I went beat Harry Potter for one glorious week and, um, you know, still is selling well 20 years later. And so that was my 15 minutes of fame that led to 20 years of uh, increased sort of impact. So we're sitting here now with more than a thousand randomized trials, probably about 5,000 studies overall, probably about 100,000 people trained in ACT several million books on ACT in every language you can mention around the world. And probably the most studied new method of psychotherapy, or psychological intervention over the last 20 years. So it's, it's been the overnight success that took 20 years to produce, but it started in a moment of desperation and of feeling as though everything that I'd worked for was going to be impossible because I literally couldn't even give a lecture to five undergraduates. You know, I, I, I just couldn't make sound come out of my mouth. I'd get so anxious and, uh, and finding that there was a, I had been tricked into a battle I didn't need to fight. And then how, learning how to walk out of that has been my life's journey. And it, what I'm, has led to these sets of processes that are now, uh, you know, going into so many areas around the world. This podcast is brought to you by Onyx Weightlifting Co. I've been very selective about finding sponsors for the show, but after much deliberation in conversation with Chris and Danny, the co-owner and founder, we decided that Onyx is beyond a great fit to support this podcast. Onyx is a brand built on providing the strongest and most comfortable straps, wraps, belts, and apparel to the weightlifting community with the leather products handcrafted by the same barbell calloused hands that you have. Make sure you pick up something today at onyxstraps.com using the code PHILWL for 10% off of your purchase. That is onyxstraps.com, O-N-Y-X straps.com using the code P-H-I-L-W-L for 10% off of your purchase. And thanks as always for supporting the show. And you, you mentioned that experience when you were eight hiding under, hiding under yeah. the bed. And I think, you know, from, from that point on and, and to the point where you were kind of deciding to go into, um, you know, a graduate program that's on some sort of, uh, psychological re related concept or topic, um, what were some of the influences that you picked up along the way in terms of the, the stuff you read or the information you, you, you came across or the people you listened to who you think created this foundation by which you could make the decisions to get a PhD and to study something that's maybe behavior related or, or, or uh, you know, 
psychologically related that again almost like creates this pl platform or springboard by which you can continue to move in the direction that has led you to creating or being a part of the creation of this massive enterprise um, that has changed so many lives. Well, you know, that eight-year-old beta had a thought. I actually talk about it in the TEDx talk, which is hearing this fighting going on uh, and, and ha having a thought very, very clearly, I'm going to do something. And at the, at the, that moment thinking I'm going to get out from underneath my bed, walk in there and separate my parents uh, for fear that they're going to actually physically start uh, a violence and, um, uh, and then realizing that that was not safe. You know, I'd literally seen my brother almost get hit in the face when he tried to do that. Um, my older brother. And so I just, you know, went back deeper underneath the bed, but, and I forgot that whole thing until much later on, you know, that I sort of, I always suppressed the memory, but I just didn't think about it. I mean, it, it just was not a focus, but the, you know, when I'm beginning to think about what I'm going to do with my life in high school, I had a natural resonance uh, towards things that had to do with psychology and the things that excited me the most actually were not so much, you know, how to eliminate anxiety or depression or substance use or something. I was mostly interested in peak performance. You know, how can we live more um, genuine, authentic, impactful, vital, uh, useful lives? And so, you know, the more humanistic uh, wing was uh, especially of uh, interest to me. This is a time in the whole just about right before the whole hippy dippy thing is going to happen. Uh, you're talking to somebody who was there on Hippy Hill when it finally did happen, you know, that was there in the summer of love, the whole thing. But it was an entire generational thing, you know, where people are looking at the man in the gray flannel suit, kind of uh, post-war, tight, hardworking, but tight uh, culture and saying, man, there's got to be something more than that. And, uh, and how are we going to bring vitality, love, connection, freedom in, into our lives uh, beyond the picket fence and the aluminum society? And um, so I, my reading was with people like Maslow, you know, like what, who are the folks who really have PICO experiences? How, you, how do you get there? But in college, I gravitated towards behavioral thinking. And I actually set up and built with my own hands a rat lab and did rat, you know, animal learning work. And the reason was, is that I kind of came to believe that if we just do what the artists and folks who write literature and the historians and it, what they're doing, I mean, we have as a culture trying to figure out how do we really prosper? How do we really be more fully who we are to be whole and free in this world? And it is so much of human thought has been focused on that. And yet here we are, even with a generational thing at the time, you know, I'm thinking of these things where it's really clearly not clicking. It's a little bit off the rails. And I wonder about what young people are thinking right now after the year of COVID and what they're seeing politically around the world and so forth. Aren't they thinking the same thing? I think so. And I hope they do something positive, but, um, you know, that sense of we need something different. We need something new. I looked around and said, you know, the, the most progressive wing of human endeavor, I'm sorry for, I mean, as much as I was interested in all these other things, I was the editor of the literary magazine. I wrote creative, you know, I was cared about art and all those kinds of things. Science to me was the only one that I said, well, that, that's really progressive. You know, like the physicist of today is not saying the same thing of physicists 20 years ago. That They've progressed. And in every area of the hard sciences, that's true. So I early on decided, you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to square the circle between people like Maslow, who was a scientist, but believed you couldn't do it experimentally. You couldn't do it the way we would think of science. It had to be more like an almost histor historical thing. And I said, no, I just don't think that's right. And I gravitated towards 
Well, I'll tell you, the guy who really got me going was uh, B.F. Skinner with his utopian novel, Walden 2. You know, I mean, I'm looking at this rat runner, pigeon picker, kind of, and I say, these principles are pretty powerful. Now, it turns out he made some major mistakes. He, he, I couldn't take him to get all the way over to Maslow and peak experience and, you know, how to really live extraordinary lives. I had to do some things and develop some things like a, a theory of language and cognition that is underneath act that right now is raising the IQ and of children around the world. And, uh, I was, you know, helping children who can't speak and is advancing our, our ability to, to really be intellectually able to uh, step up to the challenges of the world. Maybe we'll get into that. It's called relational frame theory, but I, you know, I wanted something more like, these high precision, high scope, really precise scientific principles that came out of the Animal Learning Lab that will go all the way up to something like, how can I live a life that's really whole and free and make the kind of difference uh, in my family, in my business, in, in the world that I want to make? Um, to me, that's what psychology should be about, at least in part. And uh, that's been my life journey, how to square that circle. But it started really early on and I've never wavered, um, but trying to make that mix of, you know, from the humanists all the way over to the lab-based, tight experimentalists, I, I want all of that, but directed on human uh, prosperity. What was your original or, or maybe looking at what you studied in school, um, what were, what were some of those ideas and then how has that kind of changed over time? So you kind of set us up and gave us this background and this, this evolution of the thinking involved with the science. And you talk about building, you know, uh, ways to test it, uh, in animal models, but like maybe your dissertation, some of the work then, uh, what was that focused on and how did that evolve over time? Well, I've tried to focus on principles and processes that had broad applicability that you could apply to practical problems that people were just not really focusing on. And, you know, I mentioned a book that really is transformational, uh, Walden Two, which is Skinner's utopian novel. And it's usually, you know, critics read it as like, oh, he's telling us all how we're supposed to live our lives. No, he was saying that's the challenge we should step up to. He wasn't giving an answer. He was giving a, a challenge to, to uh, take this question seriously. How do we raise our kids? How do we set up our businesses? Could we take what we know about human behavior and do a better job? And, you know, of course, this is, as I mentioned there, hippie world, and I'd lived on a commune and I thought, man, if, if you could really figure out a way to have it not be insane, a commune would be awesome. I mean, some of my happiest moments of my life were the whole, you know, commune piling in and lifting a tractor out of the mud, you know, of, you know, there's something very primitive about it. You know, the, we didn't, we're the social primates, you know, how did we end up, you know, living in our little houses and never even seeing anybody. But um, so, uh, that book was transformational, but I quickly began to focus more on philosophy of science and how do we think philosophically. So I became really interested in pragmatism and in the flaws of pragmatism. You know, why William James, father of American psychology, didn't really last. Almost everybody looks back and say, yeah, that's kind of where we came from in psychology, but it, I, did, I didn't recognize it as uh, in, the, in, in the life of, of psychologists. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to think through how to, how to think about the world. Like I, most scientists think about the world as parts, relations, and forces that are already there, we just discover, and it's like a, an, a, elaborate Lego blocks scene that you have to figure out how it's all assembled. And when you're able to do that, you know, then your theories will, will lead to models and the models will correspond with reality. 
I don't think that's what's going on. I think evolution itself says you don't even know if what you see is real. You may be seeing something that's a functional equivalent of the Matrix movie, you know, that it's really all falling green letters, but what you see looks like a wall and a door because that's how you can, you know, it's more like an operating system. You know, you don't really know what the ones and zeros are that are in the billion trans, uh, transmitters, uh, uh, transistors on your chip. What you do is you look at the GUI that's in front of you on, on your you know, little screen, your monitor. And it says things like, if you drag this little thing over to a trash can, then the file's gone forever. Well, there's no trash can. There's no file that's blue and square. It's just how you interact with complexity. And if you think about the world that way, then how we think, what we see, what our categories all are, is all up for grabs. But it's not chaos. I do believe we're living in and with the one world. I just don't trust that we have a direct access to it. And so it, it shifts a little bit. How can I think? How can I categorize? How can I speak? How can I chunk in ways that maximizes the outcomes that I want to produce? And the way that you avoid that just turning into Machiavellian selfish and insanity is you say out loud beforehand what it is that you want to do and you invite others to to check out and be part of that journey. So if you say, you know, I'm trying to come up with principles that allow me not just to predict, but also to change how I interact in the world. Well, you've just done something that a large percentage of the psychological scientists out there are not playing that game. And it's fine. You're now playing the prediction and influence game as opposed to the prediction period end of story game. Because if you think it's just a big Lego block, all you need to thing, all you need to do is be able to categorize it and predict what's going to happen. Whether you can control it or change it or do anything good with it, well, that's a technical matter. It depends. I don't know. No, but if you think about it more like an evolving system, evolving person, what is the survival thing here. What is the selection criteria? On genetic evolution, it's life and death. But how about cultural evolution? How about your personal evolution? What's the criteria? How do you know that you're making progress? And as a scientist, I said, okay, here's my game. I want principles that based on verified experiences will allow me to predict and influence, put hyphens in there. I don't want prediction without influence. I'm not interested in understanding that doesn't pay off in outcome but based on principles that have high, high precision, high scope, that have high depth, meaning when you have a, an issue, you know there's only a certain number of things you can say within this, this theoretical system, but those ways of speaking apply to many things, and there's nothing that is contradicted when you go across levels of analysis of science. You shouldn't ever say, the brain says this, but my psychological theory says that. That's wrong. Something's wrong. We're one world. It should all that. So that's the depth concept. Well, it's geeky what I'm just saying, but it's a way of taking pragmatism, which is just do what's useful, and turning it into something that is more honorable than just do what you like, dude. You know, uh, where I can say beforehand what I'm trying to produce. You can look over my shoulder and say, "Are you doing it?" And if the answer is no, walk away. Or you can say, you know, I'm not really interested in playing that game. I want to play the, I want everything to sort of fit together in a big coherent whole game. Okay, great. I'm not playing that game. I, you know, I, my theory over here, my, I'm not claiming that it's, it's the only way or the one way. I'm just trying to say it's a way and the evidence shows that when you bring your behavior in alignment to it, good things happen. So, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to dig into this geeky stuff of you know, like, what is truth? What is reality? What is, what do we even mean? And redoing pragmatism in a way that I think is responsible by requiring an a priori goal that is publicly stated and shared 
So you can walk away if you're not interested and you can hold me accountable if you are. And that new philosophy has driven ACT. And so we, our society isn't the society for ACT. It, it, I mean, the group that is primarily responsible for developing it around the world. It's called the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, which is our name for people who base what they do in behavioral science on the geek stuff I just talked about. By the way, that I rarely talk about, you got me into a corner of my own work. It's like, God, who's going to be interested in that? But uh, maybe, maybe some of your audience will be interested in that, of uh, thinking about your own mind as a tool and holding it accountable to producing results. I mean, I, I was, I was so captivated by all of that. Um, I mean, my, my, my partner, uh, she's, she's incredible. She actually gifted me the, uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn's book about scientific revolutions, um, cool. and, and paradigm shift. So I'm like a majority of the way through that. And when you started going on about the philosophy of science, it's like, okay, this is really interesting again, because I think there are plenty of concepts that are easy to be taken for granted because they exist on some other framework or have some underlying um, explanation that maybe we're unaware of. And, and the way I wanted to guide this conversation after hearing all of that is when you, when you create some sort of experiment and then you say, okay, here's the way the natural world seems to be. How can we, we measure it and then potentially change it? Change implies movement away from, something that exists and, and change doesn't always have to be for, you know, quote unquote, for the better. Um, it's, it's to create a difference. What has almost positioned us, you know, you talk about the, the, the problems we face and, and the difficulties we face and, and act as having this power to change power to change what the, the, the power to reduce or alter the experience of, of human suffering how did we get here in the first place to where that's such a prevalent thing that we need, we, we, we utilize and, and develop models to help pull us away from something that I, I don't know if from your perspective, if it's a, a natural occurrence or if it's a cultural occurrence, but how did we get to this point where act is necessary? Yeah, I think we're doing some really, really toxic things right now in the culture, and we've been doing it heavily for half a century, and we're paying the price. And you can see it in young people, you know, the usual thing. People say, oh, that's anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, but even that, consider the possibility that even your sentence about how distressing it is to see where we are with young people contains the very processes that have produced that. That even that sentence that says, oh, so many young people have depression is the problem. And that we've, we've walked ourselves out under the edge of a cliff culturally and we're, and, you know, and it is not just, oh, people are, learning to complain and they're going, oh, woe is me because, you know, we're teaching our kids to be namby-pamby. No, dude, it's suicide rates. What are you talking about? You know, in the 10 to 12 year olds, it went up 500% or something like that. I mean, it's just insane increases in, but boy, wag your finger from side to side when you say the next sentence. Because the next sentence might be, you know, gasoline on the fire that's producing this. And I've come to believe that that is the case. That So it, it's a little hard for me to kind of come into the conversation because the conversation needs to change and the principles of it need to. So let me give you two or maybe one example. For 150 years, we've been on a journey statistically to think of where we are, who we are, what we're up to in terms of top-down normative categories. Do you know that the word normal entered into the dictionary in 1848? 
normal. You couldn't say normal. It didn't exist. You can't have a conversation at the kitchen table about anything important without saying normal, usual, average, or typical. You, you can't do it. Because our entire culture worldwide, in the developed nations anyway, have been organized around statistical concepts that go back to Galton in the you know 1860s and 70s and 80s, and then a whole series of statisticians and methodologists and scientists who taught the world to think about human functioning and all things in terms of central tendency, means, standard deviations. And you, your nine-year-old knows what percentile they're in in school. And we use those tools as if they're predictive of the individual. I'll give an example that relates to sports performance. My son was uh, diagnosed as in the first percentile in terms of strength when he was about three and a half years old. Sent by the pediatrician to the PT. Diagnosis, he's got a genetic disorder. He's never going to be able to be strong. He's never going to be able to produce anything uh, physically, keep him out of all co competitive sports. He's just going to humiliate himself, take himself, take him out of that soccer team. And yeah, I get that. He used to cry coming home because nobody wanted to pick him to be on the team because he was the slowest and the weakest. You know, when we first got onto this, you know, we realized with a bit of horror, you know, that he couldn't hold a knife and fork. He couldn't cut his own food. He couldn't, couldn't write with a pen. He couldn't because he had a genetic muscle disorder. So good dad that I am, I kept him out of everything having to do with athletics other than to put him into martial arts because I figured at least he could have some exercise that's measured against his own performance. Well, 10 years later, it's now, I want to get a black belt. And I'm going like, oh, golly, I've listened to him say it over and over again. You know, I'm committed to constant, never-ending improvement toward black belt excellence, ma'am. And, you know, and, and kind of wincing because I'm thinking, son, you're never, ever, ever going to be able to do that. Because I know what the criteria are. They don't give booby prize black belts. You, you can't run that fast. You can't do that many push-ups. It's not physically possible. Uh, let me cut to the end of this story. His uh, much, you know, almost second mother, Michelle Weaver, there at his dojo, uh, says, you know, he's not going to make it unless something happens. And uh, I work with this guy named Max McManus, who's an Olympic-level coach. He's David Wise's coach. David is the just won the silver in the last win, Winter Olympics with half pipe uh, skiing. He had won the gold before that and the gold before that. Lives here in Reno. Trains in Max Max's uh, gym. I take my son, little Stevie, to him. I'm telling him the story about how he's a, he has a muscle disorder. It's genetic. It's, he's only one percentile. Blah, blah, blah. He looks at me and I says, I don't give a shit about any of that. Let's see what he can do. And he has him doing the weirdest damn exercises. And he spun this little guy's, well, he's not so little, he's growing, but he spun this guy's head, you know, I don't know, oh, you can't do that. And Stevie's saying, yeah, I can. He said, no, you can't jump that high. Yeah, I can. Let me try. <laughs> and within one month at his uh, gym, he's 25% stronger. And I'm going, holy shit, I've been lied to. Anyway, bottom line, he now teaches at the dojo, has his black belt, is considering getting a second black belt. You know, kicks with a force that is frightening, punches with the force that you wouldn't even want to hold the pads. Does he have to work stronger, harder, longer than anybody else in the dojo to get the same level of improvement? Yes, he does. He has to do twice at least, maybe three times the work to get to the same level. But point, let me come back. When you say, I've got a child who's gifted and talented, or I've got a child who's in special ed, or I have this disorder, you know, I have a borderline personality, I am a borderline personality, or whatever the thing is, you're climbing into a clown suit 
that is inside our statistical methods that says that these normative categories predict. Now, here's here's the, I just gave you a story in which it didn't, but here's the final thing. It'll take me two minutes, but it just shocked my world and completely changed it in terms of what I'm doing in my life. I've discovered in this journey as I've really gotten more serious about how to put psychological flexibility processes into human lives that normative categories done the usual way, means and standard deviations, the whole randomized controlled trials, all those things you learn in STAT 101, the physicists figured out in the 1880s and proved that in the 1930s, it's accepted science and all of physical science, but not behavioral science. The only way you can go from a collective to predicting the behavior of the individual elements in the collective over time is if the phenomena doesn't change over time and every unit is identical following the same dynamic model. It's called ergodicity. There's a few things in nature that are like that, like a few noble gases. And if you know what the volume of the gas does, you know what the molecules of the gas do. But human behavior is not like that. So here's the thing. We've been lied to for 150 years. We think the percentiles predict the future. They don't. They can't. It's mathematically impossible. And then if you really want to light your hair on fire, you say, well, why didn't the Galtons know that? Why didn't the R.A. Fishers know that? Why didn't the statisticians know that? What, what every physicist knows, that ergodicity says you can't go from the collective to predicting the, the trajectory of the individual elements over time. And here's why. It's because all of those statisticians I just mentioned Carl Pearson and the Pearsons are R.A. Fisher and Fisher Z. If you do have taken a stat class, you know what I'm talking about. Analysis of variance, all of that. Norm, standard deviation, standard deviation, that's Galton. He made it up. They were all eugenicists. Everybody I mentioned was a professor of eugenics. And what they were doing was categorizing people so they could decide who should have children and who shouldn't. And guess what? The ones who should have children were white upper class members of the elite society in the UK where all these kind of methods came from. And we know where that went. It was a horror. So we are living inside a eugenic dream of statisticians who think they're giving us the history of ourselves and our children. And it's bull. It's wrong. It's mathematically false. And so what are we going to do? We have to go from categories to empowerment principles. I don't care what your percentile is. I don't care what the category is that you're, you know, gives you that clown suit you want to climb into. Oh, I have this kind of depression or that kind of depression. No, what I care about is what are you doing? What are the processes that you are putting into your life? And if you want to be a high performer, you better put processes into your life that facilitate that if you want to be a healthy person or have good relationships or on and on it goes and we know a lot about what that is that's what i've spent 40 years trying to figure out but i'm not the only one there's a whole bunch of other folks out there and so that's the long rant but uh crazy where it went um and it's put me in a position now where I've, I'm going, oh, my God, 98% of psychology is wrong. And what are we going to do about it? Hopefully fix it fast so that the next generation isn't living inside these top-down normative categories because the kids are fed up with it. Do you know they, they don't even, they won't allow books to be called abnormal psychology anymore? The kids won't buy them. They're now called psychopathology. Why? Because abnormal, they sniffed it out. I don't want to go inside your clown suit normal. What are you talking about abnormal? What do you mean, gay? Is that what you mean? You mean somebody who has, uh, who's not binary? Is that what you mean? F you, I'm not doing it. And so the kids have learned because they've grown up that it's, kind of have it your way, but they're being encouraged by their elders to live inside the clown suits. 
I think we need to pull the clown suits off and give people empowerment principles and stop giving them categories to try to live inside. Yeah. And I, I imagine most of the people listening to this who have spent, you know, the last 20, 25, 30, 40, 45 plus years living under this kind of, as you call it, like this normative kind of top-down model, there, there's a lot of, uh, not not programming, but like there's a lot of human experience that goes into living in a culture and in, 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 in a way that embraces that or embodies that. And hearing this, it's like, okay, well, what's the pivot away from that? What's, you know, instead of like, you know, what's, what's the, what's the, the solution basically. Um, and you kind of talked about identifying these processes by which you can kind of climb out of the, the clown suit. So I think this would be a good time to kind of introduce the, the processes. Yeah. If we're going to, we're going to focus on empowerment processes basically. And the, there's a flip side processes that take you in the wrong direction. You want to know that so that you can kind of notice, well, how did I end up in this position where these normative categories are being thrown on me or I'm using my own, in my own mind. And so yeah, I can do it in, it's, it's really six major things and two kind of extensions into different levels, but, Essentially, what we know, and how do, how do I just preface, how do I know that I'm saying that? Well, well we've done a meta-analysis or a systematic review of every study that ever claimed to use to find the pathway to positive outcomes in mental health using statistical means that people accept. Now, I have problems with some of the stats, but... Okay, if 90% of psychology is wrong, everything's going to gonna have problems with it. But just using what people accept now is how do I know how people got better? Okay. And so my team, my, uh, Stefan Hoffman, myself, Joe Sorochi, a well-known scientist I've just mentioned in their labs, almost 60 people worked for three years looking at every single study that ever claimed to have found such a thing. And we looked at 55,000 studies, read each one of them twice, took three years to do it. And we ended up with 281 replicated, reliable, properly done findings. And I can tell you that what I'm about to tell you about the processes of change that really matter account easily for 56% of every finding in the history of the world for every method ever done with a randomized trial done properly as to why it helped. And it can be summarized as psychological flexibility and mindfulness. If you extend it a little bit, that 56% can become 82%. And then there's some things that are left that are not easily in that model. But and what is in there? Well, learning how to be more o emotionally open so that you can learn from your past from what your body's telling you, what your memories are telling you, what your emotions are telling you without entanglement, without being knocked over by it. You need to be able to carry your past into the present in a way that's open and non-entangling. You, you have to do the same thing with your judgments and thoughts. You, be able, you have to be able to think in a flexible way, but without getting wrapped around the axle of uh, difficult thoughts or scary thoughts. You need to have a little bit of a sense of perspective on your thoughts. Take what's useful, leave the rest. You need to be able to come into the present moment, which is the only place we ever live, and to do it consciously from this part of you that's more that's deeper and more spiritual and it doesn't have a kind of a stake in what clown suit you're wearing, but this deepest sense of you as a whole person that is beyond categorization that connects you in consciousness to others, using that part to show up into the present moment and say, what's here? What's right now, inside and out? And then if you do those four things, which are a pretty good definition of mindfulness, focus on what brings meaning and purpose into your life. What are the qualities of being and doing that you want to put in your next life moment? I don't mean just your goals. That's important. But I mean, why that direction is even chosen in the first place. I mean, the, the deepest meaning of the goals, 
the purpose of the goals, uh, whether it's learning how to be more loving or genuine or competent or helpful or useful, or I don't know what it is. You tell me it's, but it's going to be an adverb or an adjective. It's not going to be a thing you can hold and put in a box. You know, your wedding ring is not your relationship. You can put the ring in the box. You can't put a loving relationship in a box. And so, and no matter how much loving you've done, there's more loving to do. And by the way, tomorrow your, your spouse is going to piss you off. So you, you better be working on it because you're never done. And then how do you then mobilize your behavior around that so that you're building larger and larger patterns of values-based action? Those are the six. I can distill them down to three. The first two were how do you learn to be more open? The second two, how do you learn to be more aware? The last two, how to be more actively engaged in a life worth living? And then I can collapse those three into one. How do you learn to be more psychologically flexible and to avoid the inflexibility processes of avoiding your emotions or clinging to positive ones, getting entangled in your thoughts, disappearing into rumination and worry instead of in the present moment, and instead of this deeper sense of self, buying into the clown suit persona mask, you know, the original Greek marrying of person, the personality that you think you have to be and show the role you have, and therefore not taking the risk to really say what you deeply care about, nor mobilize your behavior around it, but just kind of try to get enough money or Instagram likes that you... Uh, feel is a little better than you did yesterday. Uh, those inflexibility processes are what we're actively encouraging. It's what's killing our kids. It's what's, you know, like termites just inside us, just kind of eating away at our own vitality and wholeness. And we, it's not completely unnecessary. Now you do need to extale that socially and you need to put that into your body and health practices. So, this, I've been talking about psychology, and psychology is not all of it. There's also the social, cultural dimension. Scale those things into relationships. And there's also all these parts of you as a physical organism. you got to take care of your muscle and your heart and your gut biome and all the rest. You're part of a whole ecosystem. There's more cells in your body that are not human than are human. And so you better be attending to these other levels as well. But those are empowered by the psychological flexibility process. So those are the six. And you're never done. But it's just like, you know, getting stronger and more flexible and having greater endurance. You're never done. You, you work on those things because those are the processes that allow you, for example, to perform or play sports well or whatever, or age uh, easily and so forth. And uh, you don't wait till you're sick and then say, oh, geez, I guess I got to go exercise. So what are you doing waiting uh, on, you know, waiting till a train wreck before you start working on your mental and uh, behavioral health? Yeah, and I think to make this, you know, uh, I, I obviously, uh, not obviously, but I, I read uh liberated mind and I've read, you know, a few papers and, and I'm working through one of the, the textbooks that you were co-author on. And so I, I've, I've gotten a lot of exposure to these ideas and, and they make sense when you talk about them. For people who are hearing this for the first time, could we maybe walk through an example that showcases someone experiencing something without the implementation of these processes and then what that looks like when you're kind of layering them on top of a situation um, to create more psychological flexibility. Yeah, and I might add to that, Josh, real quick. Um, you know, if we think of it as a constant practice similar to an exercise regime, what would what would it look like for someone to just get started in this if maybe they're not even experiencing something that they're consciously aware of, um, but they want to dig into ACT? What would kind of a, a starting... I hate to use the word template look like for them. 
Yeah, let me give an example. Actually, this is a study we just did, um, but because I know you're you're interested in high performance and you're interested in, um, you know, we've got power lifters in here and folks who are physically training. So we did a study working with uh, uh, CrossFit uh, athletes in which we were doing a static weight hold. And the weight's not very great, but you do a static weight hold and you'll find out. I don't care how fit you are. It won't be very long as those muscles had exhaustion, you know, like a two pound weight held at 90 degrees, you know, a couple minutes from now are going to, going to be challenging. And so we, we did a couple of things. It was a series of studies. We also did a planking study with similar things. And, and we start, did the kinds of things coaches would tell you to do. So focus on your form, for example, or when pain shows up and so forth, uh, distract yourself. Uh, think of, uh, uh, other things. Um, or uh, we used some of the things I was just talking about. So for example, we did a, a one of our conditions uh, in which when it starts, uh, you're starting having thoughts like, I can't possibly do this, or this is too painful, or whatever. Uh, sing the thoughts. Literally just sing them out uh, louder. If, if you don't want to use your breath to say, do it mentally. So, so we had people singing mentally while planking, for example. Well, if we could show that if you, you, uh, let me give you a couple more just so you have a sense. Another one we said, uh, so go inside the sensations that you're having and see if you can sort of say yes to them. And if anyone sticks out and says, no, I can't have this, go there and, and almost in your mind's eye, create that sensation and put it there on purpose. Own it. Say yes to it. Like create the the heat or create the uh, sense of uh, pulsing that, or, cre uh, you know, whatever that particular sensation is. I've just given you two examples. The singing it one is a diffusion exercise. That's taking a thought and sort of looking at it instead of looking at the world from it. The uh, uh, saying yes is an acceptance exercise of uh, uh, not a tolerance, resignation, acceptance, but the kind that comes from the original etymology of the word, which means to receive is just to receive a gift which we still have in English. We say we give something precious to someone. We say, here, would you accept it? We don't mean, would you tolerate the gift? We mean, will you willingly take it? So willingly take the gift of sensation and say yes to your sensations by actually creating them. Well, on our static hold tests, we're writing these studies up now and our planking and so forth. If I compared the kind of things coaches often say to these psychological flexibility uh, exercises, there was a notably greater improvement in being able to accomplish these exercise tasks. So the opportunity to work on your psychological flexibility is everywhere, whether it's uh, making a decision about whether to eat a cookie or something that's healthy or whether or not to, uh, you know, call a, a friend and have a difficult conversation that you've been putting off or blow it off and say maybe next week or, uh, you know, whether or not you're going to show up, you know, full on in your startup and how we're going to work together and work hard as a team to, create a business that works and that supports each other, each other as a, you know, person spending our lives doing that. So uh, I've given you just two. And, you know, if you get into the self-help work, it's very easy to do. You don't even have to pay any money. The World Health Organization has a cartoon book of ACT that they're deploying in the Ukraine right now that they tested with South Sudanese refugees in Uganda and with Syrian refugees in Turkey and the European Union and so forth. And, um, uh, you know, how bit.ly links work, B-I-T period L-Y, put in capital W-H-O with underline 
the symbol and then ACT. So WHO, all caps, underline ACT after bit.ly. And there's a free book. It'll, it's a cartoon book. It's my colleague, Russ Harris, wrote when who the World Health Organization pro approached me, I put him off to Russ because Russ is, uh, I'm too much of a geek to do the damn thing. He did a great job and it's now deployed around the world in 18 different languages for free because it's been subjected to gold plated to the nines randomized trials and it's quite helpful to people. So, we, and I'm just mentioning one. I mean, just go on the internet, put in psychological flexibility or act and stuff. Make sure you get reliable resources. There are pirated, you know, nonsense resources out there of people, but get the ones where with authors that are known and start exploring it. You can do it for free. And um, uh, I can give some other examples if if you like, Tom, but I hope that one, that one gives a little bit of a sense over on that first pillar of uh, openness as to the concrete things that you might do tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's very helpful. Yeah, and then yeah. You, you 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 well, you mentioned you kind of having you you give a few examples of um, someone having a thought that may be in direct opposition to what they're doing, and that like oh, this is really hard, this hurts, you should stop. Why you know why are you doing this? Like this is this is incredibly painful. Um, and then you try to diffuse from that thought and see it as a thought uh, versus as the experience. Uh, and then you talked about um, trying to open up or say yes to the actual like physical sensation. So yeah. that kind of like you know, all of those metabolites building up and, and creating that burn, um, just like the, the instability that comes from like the slight shaking of your body as you're, as you're trying to maintain this position. And, and almost like calling forth that sensation to like live with it and, and live in it instead of trying to be separate from it. Yeah. It, and then you gave an example of, you know, someone who again is diffusing from a thought, maybe more, more di diet related where it's like, Oh, it's like, I really want to eat this cookie or have this treat or have a snack or something. Why would you, you know, how, how are you deciding the direction in which to, to move in the first place, right? Because someone resists a cookie for a particular reason. Yeah. It's not just like cookies are bad. Therefore I shouldn't eat cookies. It's like, this isn't in alignment with dot, dot, dot. So how, how are we kind of directing these changes in perception and action to um, align ourselves with something else? Yeah. And that's really important and really uh, uh, tricky, Josh, because, you know, you can easily take, have, let that problem solving mind, turn you into kind of the uh, uh, I have to robot that has all these rules. Like I have to be like this and not eat that cookie. And, you know, nobody likes being told what to do. You, try it with your kids and see what happens. Um, and try it with yourself and see what happens. And it's the same thing happens. You know, as soon as you say, I'm going to in that kind of aversive commanding Part of you says, no, I'm not. And you can't make me, even if it's you that's saying it. So the piece that's important and the most important, and also the trickiest, is to hold these directions as a choice, as a free choice, as a whole and free. The qualities of being and doing that I want to put in my life's next moments are X. And out of that, goals come, you know, and if they fit, they will be vitalized by that choice. So, for example, uh, let's go back to a high performer. What are you really up to in uh, that journey? I suppose you're up to this. I'll feel better about myself when I win that competition. Uh, dude, what that means is right now I'm not okay with myself. You know, you can't trick yourself. You're listening. I mean, suppose you were like behind the door where your parents are talking about you and they said, you know, this kid's never going to be anything. 
So I'm going to make him do it so that he will be worthwhile because really I don't trust him. I don't think he's going to, you'd be like shrinking in horror of what your parents were saying. When you do that to yourself in your own mind, you know, part of you is shrinking or maybe just saying F you. I mean, you can't make me. Uh, so what if it was more like here, I'm going to play this game and I'm playing a game at being my best self, not because it'll eliminate some sort of fear or something. Cause that means if I'm playing that game, I have to first buy into the fear, buy into the self-criticism, etc. Maybe I'm doing it so that I can have a voice in the world. Maybe I want to do it so that I can be part of a larger group or something that's of importance to me. Um, I don't know if he's the best example, but I was listening to Schwarzenegger uh, not too long ago about his decisions on how he became competitive. And it was a mix of things that I felt good about as a psychologist and things that I didn't. But there was a piece in there that was really, you know, I want to be part of this world. I want to be, you know, um, excellent. Well, that's a cool thing. That's a good game to play, isn't it? It can be. And if you play it right, look, when you were three or four years old and it was, can I touch the tree before you touch me? You put every single ounce of energy that you had into making it to that tree before you're touched. Nobody had to get out there and say, this is really important. You know, you want to spoil the game? Do what the, I forget the Middle Eastern uh, dictator who, who said he was going to, you know, like, you know, harm the family of the soccer players if they didn't win. You remember that thing that happened about 10 years ago? And of course it was horrible. They played a very bad game. Nobody wants to, that's not a game. Nobody wants to play that game. You know, you're going to harm my family if I don't score a goal. Really? But we do that mentally. So the values piece is, what if you get to choose what the game of life is about in this area? And just like choosing a game, once you choose the game, it's going to have certain rules. It has certain outcomes. But you get to say, I'm playing tennis or I'm playing soccer or I'm, I'm playing weightlifting or whatever it is you're doing. What if life itself was like that? And I'm going to play a game of being a hell of a good dad. I'm going to play the game of being an awesome spouse or a wonderful coworker or a super teacher. You can do that. And if you did that, why wouldn't you bring into your next moments the same vitality that you did when you were three and just trying to get to the tree? You can. So what values are, or are, are after you learn to sort of rein in the dictator within, not let's let your mind dictate to you, not let's let your emotions knock you around, come into the present moment and now, okay, what are the qualities of being and doing the adverbs that you want to manifest in your life? How would you know what they are? Well, I'll give you four ways in. If you're writing a story, what do you want the story to be about? Do you have a hero or a guide or somebody you look up to in this area? Okay, tell me about them and what they stand for in your mind. And you just told me what your values are. Take the areas that bring joy, vitality, connection, purpose to you. Take just a moment, pick one that comes to your mind, slow it down, put it in slow motion and notice what are the qualities that are inside there that you want to more regularly put in your life. Or take the things you struggle with that are most painful to you, the places that you hurt the most. Take that moment, slow it down, now flip it over and say, and what does that suggest I deeply care about? And whatever it is, like if it was betrayal, you probably care about love and connection. You probably care about, you know, intimacy and loyalty. Um, you know, if it was, um, uh, you know, lying or letting somebody down, you probably care about being honest. You probably care about being there for others and being a, a good friend who can be trusted. So 
uh, story, heroes, sweet, sour. Click through it and you will, it's right there inside you right now. You don't have to work hard to get there. You're yearning to be about something that's bigger than just the persona clown suit applause and Instagram likes. I mean, it, you are yearning to be about something that's big. I'm about big is the wrong, wrong way to say it. That is so for you. And if you can get that, it's like plugging your, you know, your light into to the power outlet. You've just plugged into life's power outlet. Values is the only thing that's ever really produced the kind of uh, human progress that we yearn, yearn for, especially done in community. We're the social primates. So shared values are really awesome. Team sports are really cool. Being part of a, a dojo or being part of something, being part of a community, I would guess the listeners to this part of COD podcast feel sort of like they're part of a community with you, Josh. I would guess that. And that's a powerful part of it. There's a we to it, not just a me to it. Yeah, and I think it, I, I don't know if you've explicitly done this on any other podcast, but I, I would be interested in hearing how this, 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 this framework, um, it, it, and specifically the values portion, um, how that is, is a part of your life and how you've, like what your values are specifically, um, how you kind of operate on a daily basis to move towards those values, and maybe also what you struggle with and, and what could be an impediment to behaving in a way that's in alignment with, with them. Yeah, I, I kind of do act every day, you know, I mean, I've, for 41 years, uh, I've been uh, doing my best. Uh, I'm not very good at it. I always always say uh, I don't hold myself off as a shining example. And if you want to know why, just ask my wife. But but I would also say this. uh, And by the way, would you ask my wife? Do do ask? Has he gotten any better? And I pretty much know that what the answers are going to be. And that last one will be, yeah, I do see the progress. I do see him work on it. So. uh, you know, I think as long as we are making progress, excuse me for living, you know, that it isn't enough in the sense of rest on your laurels, but it is the journey that we'll all be on because none of us are God's gift to psychological flexibility or anything else. I mean, I'm not talking to anybody who very likely who's a Nelson Mandela, you know, I'm just not, but can you be more, of who you really are today. Yeah, you can, you can. So, you know, I try to use the value stuff as a kind of a check-in. I was writing something this morning. I, I had my coffee. I knew I'd got, uh, the, there was a power outage. So I was uh, surprised that uh, it really was not 6.30. It was, um, 740 and I was going to be on this podcast very soon and I hadn't had my coffee yet. I get my coffee and I'm going to go try to remind myself uh, even what the podcast is and prepare for it. And here comes a question on a listserv that I started 15 years ago called Act for the Public. You can find it on groups.io. It's free. And somebody asking a question and he was said was, you know, values are supposed to be something you can choose, but the things I really care about, it doesn't look to me like I can choose because I really, really, really want to be competent. And I can say I'm choosing to be competent, but I'm still not competent. And so I wrote for half an hour, giving myself only 10 minutes to grab my now lukewarm coffee, nuke it and come down and talk to you, Tom and Josh. But, um, uh, in that response I was writing about was, this is a trick of the judgmental mind saying, you need that outcome to have that value. I say, no, the value is the direction. What could you do today 
that would set up to being more competent in what you deeply care about at work. If you're a healthcare worker, you know, what could you read? What could you? And then I said, you know, I'm sitting here right now. I got a thing coming up and I'm wondering, am I just doing this to be right? Am I showing off? Am I just trying to, you know, here's a list I started and people know who Steve's name, Steve Hayes' name is, and I'm going to tell them what values are. Or am I really trying to do something that will help this dude who's had his mind pull a little trick on him that you have to have the the overall performance before you can really go on a values-based journey when it's, it's a trick of mind. It's the mind basically saying, I'm going to decide. And it's all a matter of judgment. And, you know, are you deserving? Are you competent? You're not competent. This value stuff is bull. You know, okay. Now, and, and my answer to that, to my question, in the post I just did, it had to be quick because I had to get down here and talk to you, was a biblical quote, by its fruits you will know them. So how will I know whether or not spending that little time to write a post that people will read. There's a couple thousand people who could read it, probably a couple hundred who will read it and it'll disappear. And it's a half an hour of my life and I'm 70 freaking four years old and I got a lot of things to do. And boy, if I could work on my book, my next coming book, you know, maybe that would be more important. But I don't know. I don't want to sit here and say, I just did a values based thing. I don't know. But I do know this that I spend hours each day trying to be useful and helping people to grasp processes that live with their lives. And I do it because that eight-year-old under the bed said, I'm going to do something. And this is the form that shows up. Is it only that? Probably not as only that I catch myself, you know, playing a pride game or a, you know, look at me game or being right game. I, I catch myself doing that all the time. So, but by the fruits, you know, them. you know, like when you get up and it's early and there's that energy and it's like, I'm going to do this. To me, that's a, a little indicator that I'm going in the right direction. And uh, if I could do as good a job with my relationship with my wife as I do with my relationship with my uh, listserv, I'd feel a little better <laughs> working on it. It's really hard <laughs> for me. That's probably the hardest area. Thank God I got a, a very loving and tolerant wife who whacks me over the head when my head <laughs> won't get in, fit into my hat, you know, but. Uh, yeah, well, and I, I, I'll let Tom jump in eventually, but the 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 thing that, you know, you talk about uh, acting in a way that tends to be in alignment with, with what you value explicitly or implicitly, um, and, and you can be unsure, but you know you can, f you feel activated and, and you're functioning in a way that is moving you in the direction um, that you, you feel like is the direction you should be moving in or you, you want to be moving in. When yeah. You... I think there's a, there's a sense. I think people can feel movement. You can feel vitality and, and you know, it's not just caffeine or, 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 or worse. You know, you, you feel a, a flow. And I think a values based life when you get out of your own way, learn to carry your history to the moment, be more flexible in that way, be more conscious about what's present, is that's that's a place where if you're playing a game, it's the kind of game where first you win and then you play. Well, usually when we play games, you know, often we play it first, we lose, then we play like, because I'm no good, I'm going to do this. You just played the first, I'm going to lose. And then I'm going to play 
because no matter what you do that comes out of that, it, even if it produces progress and all of it, it will still be, yeah, but I'm where you started. So what if you could sort of change the rules of the game? I'm going to play a game in which it's okay to be me and my deepest yearnings are actually worthy of my attention. That's the first you win, then you play a game. I don't know what's going to happen in terms of goals and achievement and all that. That startup might fail. That could happen. But boy, are you playing it, you know, full on. And there's a joy to that. And yeah, often I think achievement comes from that. I actually I just had a, I did a podcast uh, yesterday with a guy who I've kind of followed for 10 years and, and watched his, his, his video content and listened to his podcast and kept up with him. And, and we, we had initially, I reached out to him in April and in the middle, I reached out to him in August and then he just got back to me and we scheduled it and we recorded a podcast. And I was like, you know, it was essentially us talking for two hours about, these kind of like wisdom traditions. And I was, I was kind of telling him, you know, when I, when I started watching that content, like I, I was in this place where I, I felt like I was just a, a philosophical zombie, right? Like a pea zombie. Um, and somehow my life has kind of organized itself in this way by just being open to experience and, and kind of putting myself out there to where I feel like I'm in the best possible position I could be in. Like, I don't think anything could have worked in a way that would have made it better than it is. And like, that's not saying it's perfect or great or easy or, or whatever, but um, it just, it, it kind of mirrors that idea of like, I opened up to the process and just introduced myself to a lot of uh, choice points that pushed me more in the direction of what I value and what I want. And I think what I value largely is having like loving and deep, intimate relationships with people. And I don't think I'm unique in that. I think I just really prioritize it. Um, hence the podcast, you know, having hundreds of episodes and, and like me just continuing and maintaining relationships that mean a lot to me. So when you talk about values and you talk about these concepts of, of, of doing this, you know, quote unquote self work to, to move yourself in the direction of what you want your life to be, or the direction of where you think it should organize itself, how, how does that change when you're interacting with people who are also working on that and operate under the, under the same operating under the same machinery that we are, because I don't, I don't want to necessarily put people in a clown suit. I don't, I don't want to necessarily move them away from their values and their, 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 um, in the, the things that influence them to become the people that they want to be. So how have you shifted this perspective to like interpersonal relationships into the broader, broader context? It's an awesome question. And you know, where, I started as a psychologist, I was focused really on the, you know, individual psychological processes. But as things have gone forward, you know, it's become more and more clear that so many of the, uh, we're, we're such social beings that so much of what's of importance to us needs to be scaled in that way. And, and, and it's not difficult. So if you click through those flexibility processes, if you really care about you know, emotional openness and so forth with yourself, well, then you also have compassion for others and the difficult emotions that they may have, the difficult memories and experiences and histories that they may have. So compassion towards others is a natural social extension of that. If you really care about taking a step back, noticing what's going on in your mind and being able to think in a a flexible and broad way, but without domination of that voice within, you know, that really you kind of allow yourself to notice your own thinking and take what's useful. Well, that means when you come into connections with others, you become really a good listener and uh, engaging in genuine conversations and asking people about what they think and and asking people to, you know, what else do they think, you know, and to explore and share with you, you know, what is there for them and, and their own uh, wisdom and, and uh, uh, thoughts about how best to proceed and so forth. Put this into a work context. You could see how these two things would be powerful. You know, when, when organizational consultants or ACT folks go in and look at that, they often will ask the person who's the boss, et cetera, things like, you know, 
the people who work with you, uh, how many kids do they have and what are their names? You know, and uh, yeah, sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Or where do they live? I don't know. And you're like, what? How long has this person been with you? This your primary secretary, you know, 10 years. They say, dude, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? And you're creating a work environment just as an example with those two or take that, that second one, you're in a meeting and it's all one way, my way or the highway, you know, I'm the boss. This is going to be it. You know, blah, blah, blah. you know, the, the, the benefit of the group can't happen in that environment. Yeah. You can dictate to people and make them do stuff, but what if they have better ideas than you do? You don't even know what they are. They won't share them with them. They won't, you know, they'll learn how to shut up. You know, you yank and rank and do all the crazy things people do, uh, you, you know, trying to drive performance out of a team without actually building a team that you'd want to be part of. If this uh, present moment focus without rumination or worry consciously, if you take the t time to scale that socially, it becomes a shared sense of consciousness, a sense of a, of a we that, and not just a me that's happened to you in your life. You've looked in the eyes of your lover and you've kind of blended with them for a moment and it's not unhealthy. It's like awesome. It's like, there's really clear that we are in a loving relationship in that you can have that in a, in a work team. There can be a, we, you know, as you learn, who else is there? And you take a little time to know, to notice uh, who they are. And when we're in a team, let's say, and we're about to disappear from what's present and needs to be dealt with here into rumination and worry, we can bring it back to what's present, what's present in the, in the room, what's present in the work team, what's present in the challenge that we have uh, in trying to create, uh, let's say, an organization that works or a relationship that works. And then values can be shared into shared values. Those are the best of all. And commitments into shared commitments. And those are the best of all because, you know, we tend to really follow through with our commitments when they're made public and social, not as a way of dumpling responsibility, but as a matter of sharing. And you, you can show that. I mean, people who are wanting to be you know, great athletes and so forth. I bet you your gym and your gym mates are really important to your workouts. And, you know, you can do it in a way that, that wah, 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 you know, we get a little, I'll support you in doing what, in, in what doesn't work for you and you support me in doing what doesn't work for me. You can get that happening in a group, but you can also get the one where, you know, we're the ones who are committed to this constant improvement physically in, inside our gym, you know, or our, our dojo or our team or so uh, socially scale these psychological flexibility processes and create a social form of openness, a social form of awareness and a social form of active engagement and a, a process of putting shared values into the world whether that's your relationship or your work setting or wherever your church group or wherever it is, uh, you're going to find a powerful way forward to do that. I've written a book called pro social with a, a guy named David Sloan Wilson, a major evolutionary biologist and a psychologist um, in Australia as well. And it deliberately tried to scale psychological flexibility with how you build cooperative teams and it's being put into, you know, team-based settings around the world right now. You can uh, go to prosocial.world and see what that group is doing. Uh, but the book is uh, available and inexpensive. Yeah, and I, I just want to say and, and, and comment on how you talked about having those experiences in your life that maybe aren't, you don't, Ex explicitly label as being value driven, but are, you know, I use the word activating, like to me, that kind of makes sense, but are activating this entire conversation has been just that like the, the array or the, the, the degree of, um, I don't know, just, just that feeling kind of existing within me as I hear you talk about, you know, exploring this within yourself and then exploring it with other people and, 
and, and the meaning that can have and, and the change it can also have in the, the power that can um, kind of like be, be instilled in, in yourself and others uh, with the implementation of these, these processes. I mean, that's, it's really incredible. I hope people listen to this and re-listen to it, which is what I'll do. I'll probably listen to this podcast five to six times. Um, Tom, do you want to jump in and, and, and ask some questions? Yeah, I actually had a follow-up um, to what you just spoke about, Stephen. It, it sounds a lot like, you know, these essential components of ACT are principles by which we relate to ourselves. And what you're saying is that those principles can be applied to others in an organizational context. Um, and, and maybe this is an opportunity to talk a little about, about relational frame theory and that how that plays into, into all this. Yeah, underneath act is this theory of mind and uh that is a concrete experimental i mean i'm playing the game of prediction and influence as we talked about and so and a lot of the theories of cognition that are out there are not they're they're telling a story about how language happened how thought works blah 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 but it doesn't necessarily mean you can use it to do anything different and um so we have really taken the time. The core of it is very, very simple, which is the, the mind is not associative, it's relational. And it started in the relation be, in the social primates that we are. The thing that your 12-month-old baby does that if they don't do, they're not on this journey towards uh, human language where when they eventually, after several examples, they'll learn the name of an object. And then they don't just have the object that they learned to name. When they hear the name, they'll orient towards the object. One direction becomes two, one relation becomes combined, becomes networks, and it starts changing how you interact with the world. Anything that's in the network can be changed by the network. So learn it in one, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. That's uh, 40 years of work and a ditty. And it's very, very different idea that... uh, frankly, what's happening with artificial intelligence and natural language programming fits it a lot more than these purely associative models that were really more like chalk on one hand will go on to the other hand when you touches it. That's been how we've tried to think about how the mind works, how language works, and it just doesn't do the job. Now, one of the kind of bottom line of thinking relationally is when I've done the math of how many different thoughts could be in your head that you could generate right now? The answer is, and this is literally true, I've done the math on it, uh, more than there are molecules in the universe. So you might as well say that the capacity of your mind is in principle infinite. And so you better learn to put that incredible tool on a leash and be able to direct it gently in a direction to be able to think flexibly and fluidly and voluntarily, uh, but to not let it run away with you. And uh, so the diffusion methods that I have another TEDx talk on that, that I gave at the Davidson Academy here, which is for kids with IQs of 99.9% or above. And, you know, they suffer as much as anybody. The mind isn't going to, you know, being really clever and being able to generate lots of relations, which is what that IQ test is assessing, is not uh, a key to mental health. It's how the mind works, but you got to do that work to put it on a leash and to be able to direct it. And um, you'll never be, you know, master at it. I mean, uh, but you can be better at it. And um, at the point at which that's happened, you can direct your life with a lot more uh, freedom. I am close to a hard stop. I actually have a a meeting I'm supposed to be attending uh, right now. (laughs) Uh, Maybe we could just do a final question or something. We could wrap it up. Yeah, Tom, go ahead with the last one. I kind of have dominated most of the show. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel like anything I ask is going to be uh, a, a long answer. But I was wondering, uh, between ACT and self-determination theory, 
you know, there seems to be a lot of parallels. Uh, you talked today about autonomy, about values, about sure. mastery or competence. Can you talk a little bit more about how the two theories have interacted with each other and how they've developed maybe in coordination or separately over the last couple decades? Yeah, they really were separate and they've been coming together. And, um, you know, the big three that are in Rich Ryan and DC's so, uh, work, um, I have great respect for for it are there in the psychological flexibility model. We add some more because we have a theory of language that goes in there, but, you know, being able to, uh, you know, focus on belonging, which I think is central to the sense of self that we're talking about, the part of you that connects you in consciousness to others, to, to be able to focus on autonomy and, you know, what are your values? What are you up to? And be able to say, and to be able to focus on competence, to go through that trial and error process and uh, coming back and trying again, trying again, trying again. Those big three that are in self-determination theory are really critical. But I would add to it also the yearning to be oriented and to be able to show up here in the present, the yearning to understand and have things fit together in a coherent way, which is what we're trying to do uh, with uh, uh, language and cognition and the yearning to feel, to be able to really be with your own body and, and with, with uh, the felt sense that comes from your history uh, showing up in the current situation. So I want to expand self-determination theory to include three more needs. I think we come into the world yearning to feel, yearning to understand, to have things be coherent and yearning to be oriented. And so I would add that, but I don't want to subtract it all from what they've done. I do think we have a number of new methods to be able to meet those needs and yearnings so we can uh, build out on self-determination theory uh, with uh, this very concrete step-by-step tools you can use uh, approach that's inside the the ACT group and the contextual behavioral science group more generally. So um, I'm working really hard to get Rich, who's one of the most cited psychologists in the world and was there at Australian Catholic University with my colleague, uh, Joe Sorochi, a close colleague I work with. Um, But I've been working hard to to get him to come to our conferences and do maybe do a little uh, webinar or podcast. So uh, I share the interest and uh, we'll see if I can, uh, He's promised to do it, so I will see if I can actually get him to come and chat with us. And uh, But uh, we're actively exploring it. The, you mentioned a book, A Liberated Mind, and that's, uh, uh, you know, self-determination theory is right. And the integration of ACT with it is inside that book. That's the best one, best read for how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would I would love to see that conversation happen. That would be, that'd be very enlightening. Yeah, he's, he's a lovely man. I know that we've had a little bit of interactions, but uh, he's also incredibly busy and, and his approaches have been massively successful around the world. So uh, uh, he's pretty, you know, distracted, but I'm, I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Steve, I just wanted to, to really thank you for uh, being so, so willing and, and, and flexible with your schedule and, and coming on the podcast. And um you know, obviously, I don't know how this feels, but bestowing the honor upon us to, to share your wisdom and, and your life experience with us and, and with all of our listeners who um, are living the exact, you know, dealing and managing and, and experiencing everything that we're experiencing. So we really appreciate it for everyone who is listening and would want to, I don't know, have a place to start with what they could check out. Would you say a liberated mind is their best bet or do you have another resource you would push them towards? Well, I also like, if you're just dealing with my books, I like uh, Get Out of Your Mind and End Your Life. Uh, mm-hmm. A liberated mind gives you the big overview. Get Out of Your Mind and End Your Life is more practical kind of skills you can use. And I would say, I'm, I'm not spamming anybody. I'm not trying to sell anything. But if you want to follow my work, just go to my website, which is my name. It's mm-hmm. www.steven, C. Hayes, Stephen with a V, middle S O C for Charlie, H-A-Y-E-S, all one word, no periods, stephenchayes.com and click on yes, please send it to me. And I'll send you not my 180 podcasts, but my 13th <laughs> is coming up and a newsletter 
you, you got me beat. I'll never catch up, Josh. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll send you something once a month or so. And uh, it's an easy one-click opt-out. If uh, I don't spam people, but if you ever get tired of it, you can get rid of it really, really easy. Um, but yeah, and if, if it's not that, do just Google psychological flexibility or acceptance and commitment therapy or training. And on almost anything that you're interested in of doing in your life, somebody out there is showing how it can be relevant because these processes are relevant everywhere that a human mind goes. And that's uh, everything we do. Okay. And then Tom, for people who want to keep up with you, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, Instagram, Fantone92. It's my middle name, F-A-N-T-O-N-E-9-2. I'm also uh, on LinkedIn at Tom Newton, but don't have a ton of content out there. Just appreciate being able to sit in on this podcast. Yeah, and for everyone listening, you can follow me at Josh underscore Phil W L. That's P-H-I-L-W-L. You can go to philosophicalweightlifting.com if you want some weightlifting, powerlifting, or super total coaching. And we will catch you guys next week on another episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. Mm-hmm.